The stagnation of real wages in the developed world despite significant increases in automation-induced productivity over the past few decades is common knowledge. With the import of cheapened resources and manufactured goods from the recently industrialized Global South, the surplus abstract labor, value is imported, making the costs of living more bearable for the working class in the North, which is another civilizing mechanism that increases stability in the context of increasing public economic austerity. Capital treats redundant labor as a social externality for which it refuses to bear responsibility and costs. See end note 10. Any social externalities dealt with by any party except capital become an uncompensated source of fetish value for capital, similar to the contribution of the rest of nature and life-making labor to the reproduction of commodified labor. In industries where automation of the production process and deskilling are impossible or overly costly, automation is used as a managerial tool to exercise higher control over staff through commanding, monitoring, and ranking workers as staff performance. As a result, despite remaining skillful, the laborer is further pressured to become a mere cog in the managerial machinery. The subordination of laborers to the will of capital through mechanization also distorts their ability to decide on the purpose of their collective work in tune with their broader communal purposes and thus deprives them of their ability to determine and realize the final cause of living well in common. The division of labor, or the organization of work as the formal cause of value production, is reshaped through automation. In other words, capital constantly remakes the production process in its own image, Smith, 2022, page 140. More importantly, automation accelerates the infiltration of capital's final cause into the entire causal structure of labor in the commodity production process. The automation process across the economy should be seen as turbocharging the decommunization of, more than, human creative power and thus decomposing the potentialities to produce true value. Time determines work, see Mela Mendez and Carby Hall, 2020. Capital plays a decisive teleological causal role by changing the temporal structure of work, thereby imposing its logic growth for the sake of growth, on the production relations to secure the making of capitalist value. This is now much more pronounced in the so-called gig economy. Concerning the work of the rest of nature, capital desynchronizes chronobiological rhythms, resulting in the loss of life's natural, control, agency over and through time. Time is no longer tuned with the natural rhythms of ecological and social reproduction. Automation is also linked to the intensification and acceleration of value extraction from the sources of livability, including the material causality of labor, from its biophysiological concreteness to the effective work of workers' households and community, and the material causality of the rest of nature, and the metabolic harmony between human labor and nature. The relocation of wage labor from being an insider of direct exploitative production relations to an outsider, through changes in the composition of capital, peripheralization, annexation of labor, increases primary abstraction relative to secondary abstraction. While a decline in secondary abstraction may lead to a reduction in the rate or mass of surplus value, and thus the rate of profit, extracted from labor at the macro level, it simultaneously enhances the share of other decommonized sources of value in the reproduction of capital. Consequently, the rate and mass of fetish value continue to rise, perpetuating a state of supremacy within the system. Machines may increase labor productivity, output per worker, and thus decrease the surplus capitalist value extracted from living direct labor. But this is outweighed by the increase in ecological and reproductive surplus value. And we have not yet taken the future as another source of value into account. As automation over-accelerates the perversion of true value into capitalist value at a speed far greater than the pace of the life domain for its own healthy regeneration, under the commonest state of living, future risks accumulate at an exponential rate. This leads to a greater loss of the commoning capacities of the life domain for producing true value, a colossal deficit that must be incorporated into our value theory. Part of this risk is commodified in the form of insurance commodities, commercialized ecological offsets and credits, bonds, and derivatives, 
enabling the prefigurative behaviors of those involved in these markets to become the bearers of capitalist value, see Christopher's, 2016. Here, the future as a commons of alterity is primarily abstracted and appropriated. The primary abstraction of human creativity is always at work as part of the infra-process of decommonization. Thus, even uncommodified forms of human productivity such as the self-employed labor of digital platform drivers in the gig economy, data-producing activities of social media prosumers under platform, cloud capital, or the algorithmically managed work of a university educator become, primarily, abstracted and thus perverted into reified generators of fetish value. Critics like Yanis Varoufakis and others have been quick to consider this type of labor as one of the key signs of rising, modern serfdom, under what is considered to be neo or techno-feudalism, replacing capitalism, refer to Wark, 2019, Dean, 2020, Varoufakis, 2021. See EndNote 11. This, endism, rests upon an idealistic perception of capitalism as a system based on free and fair competition overtaken by monopolies, assisted by the state. However, from a communist point of view, the fundamental features or nature of capital have not changed. New technological advancements only give new manifestations to these fundamental features or change the architecture of capital but not its essence. The period in Western capitalist history during which capital became, albeit temporarily, more competitive and less oligopolistic marked a brief ascendancy of its progressive civilizing forces. This occurred after the Great Depression and two devastating world wars fought among imperialist, regressive civilizing powers. For most of its history, however, capital has been, and increasingly will be, dependent on the feudalistic, colonialist relationship with the uncommodified, uncommodifiable work of human and non-human beings. This is because primary abstraction and appropriation are central to capital. The infiltration of primary abstraction into the inner organization of commodity production relations by replacing the secondary abstraction of labor, through precariatization and automation of work, in the global core zones coexists with the expansion and escalation of secondary abstraction of labor in labor-intensive, low-labor-cost industries of the global periphery. The precarious freelance labor power in the gig economy may no longer be bought by capital as a commodity through direct stable employment in the production process. However, it is still abstracted via meta-mechanisms other than the private production exchange nexus. The laborer is given some degree of autonomy and self-rule as a so-called freelancer. They market directly to sell the product of their creative work that embodies their labor power. Their creative work, reified but not commodified, is primarily abstracted and appropriated, rather than secondarily. They are turned into a pawn for capital, which requires them to internalize the logic of capital capitality. Work is socialized for them, but the final cause of capital is internalized through self-exploitation and the exploitative treatment of those below them. Big business capital provides the economically dependent yet executively autonomous workers with a platform for petty profit-seeking activities. This way, rentier capital gains ascendancy through seeking rent from labor instead of directly employing, buying its power, labor power, as a commodity. This process of decommonizing, through annexing decommodified or under-commodified, human creative power has gained greater momentum with the advancements of high-tech apparatuses, which serve as the already appropriated common infrastructures for the production of new fetish value. The increase in the money supply by central banks has intensified in the post-GFC and more so in the post-COVID eras. This intensification has also accelerated the growth of corporate monopolies and made their profit-seeking activities less dependent on the infra-process of perverting human creativity into productive labor. It has opened the gates for the expansion of rentier capital and the transformation of labor into a mode of work that has a strong resemblance to serfdom. The idealism of competitive markets is being increasingly shattered. But this is not new. 
Indeed, Marx putatively started from the key idealistic classical presumptions about capitalist freedom, to show the inevitability of the cruelty and contradiction that emerges from them when they are operationalized in reality. Capitalism has consistently fallen short of the ideals often attributed to it. Social reproduction theory. A communist reflection. The social reproduction theory, SRT, can roughly be categorized into two main perspectives. One perspective, championed by Maria Rosa Dalla Costa, Silvia Federici, and Selma James, among others, argues that domestic labor generates value and, as such, must be compensated. See Fortunati and Fleming, 1995, Rodriguez Rocha, 2021. According to this approach, the notions of capitalist value and value source should be expanded to the already estranged zones that are not directly subjected to private ownership, commodification, and or the private exchange of commodities for profit-making. These are the zones of precariatized labor in the so-called non-productive sector, unwaged social reproduction labor from the household to the public and civil society sectors, common pools of material and immaterial riches from natural resources to datafied records of communal digital interactions, and political institutions and struggles that determine societal desires and define the good life. The other perspective, which is influenced by Lisa Vogel, 1983, and is further developed by Titha Bhattacharya, 2017, argues that social reproduction constitutes a prerequisite for value production rather than being a direct source of capitalist value. This perspective aligns more closely with Marx's approach in Volume 1 of Capital, and as a result, situates life-making activities outside the confines of capital's inner workings, acknowledging their potential for catalyzing a deeper transformation. For example, by employing the dual engagement concept, this perspective recognizes that while care work can be commodified and integrated into capitalist production relations as care labor, it can also remain engaged in non-capitalist life-making activities and production of true value. The division in SRT is rooted in the fact that both sides overlook the fact that in capital, Marx intentionally focuses on the inner organization of capital, exclusive of social reproduction relations, rather than capitalist social relations where the reproduction of the working class happens as a socio-historical specificity, see Jimenez, 2018. But neither of these two SRT veins differentiate between true value and fetish value. Both presume one single notion of value as constructed under capital's terms. Each implies different theories of change. Considering domestic labor as a source of value would encourage demands for financial compensation while placing domestic labor outside the realm of capital would provoke the creation of autonomous care-centered economies. Interestingly, however, both contribute to the civilizing mechanisms of capital. The former approach does so by demanding a share of the surplus value civilizing capital by making it responsive to sustaining the reproduction of labor power. However, at the same time, it helps reify domestic labor power and increases aggregate demand necessary for the growth of capital. See Note 12. As Foster and Burkitt warn, such an approach misses the point of the specifically reified character of value in a capitalist society, the source of its increasingly distorted, creative destruction, of the world at large. Burkitt, 2018, page 7. The latter approach views domestic labor as a prerequisite for liberatory praxis, which remains dependent on capital to sustain it until wage labor is fully abolished. This places unwaged domestic labor, alongside the public sector and civil society, in the service of recycling capital's negative externalities by producing positive externalities, such as enhancing the communal quality of life, reproduction of labor power, knowledgeable minds, etc back into the system. Both perspectives see the abolition of wage labor as their ultimate goal, which is crucial for their transformative potential. However, their theories of change in this regard have little to do with their value theories. The two approaches in SRT would be improved, from our perspective, if they expanded their ontological views beyond the mechanical structure of capital. 
commodified labor is deeply entangled with reproductive social labor, and thus, the relationship is bilateral. According to Figure 4.3, the perversion of human creative power into human labor through the socio-economic infra-process of decommunization is not possible unless the organic configuration of the communist state of living is perverted into the mechanical structure of capitalist relations. Only then can they function as socio-cultural conditions of possibility for the emergence of labor and the exploitation of labor power. It is then that social reproduction, an alienated form of decommunized conviviality, becomes a background condition of possibility for the production and exploitation of productive labor. However, this is not a one-way relationship. Dialectically, the infra-process of decommunizing convivial relations into social reproductive relations in the modern family or community finds wage labor and the associated economic production relations as its own socio-economic condition of possibility. The so-called productive labor is employed not just to produce surplus, fetish, value but also to function as a proxy of capital for the continuation of de-essentializing social and ecological reproduction. It is not just «effective labor» that makes «wage labor» possible, but also «wage labor» that makes «effective labor» possible, in the forms emptied from their original convivial essence and brought into non-productive capitalist relations. This is the root cause of a much deeper crisis than the shortage of care in modern society. Surely, effective relations in the alienated oikos do not completely disappear, and therefore there are always potentialities for resistance and restoring their essence. However, the restoration of conviviality will depend on restoring the commoning essence of the other three sources of value. Unwaged effective work is dependent on the household income, wage, and has little choice in the nuclear family structure but to spend that wage to draw on commodified materials and the energy extracted from the sources of livability to meet its material and immaterial needs and desires. These needs and desires are socially constructed in accordance with the imperatives of living under capitalism and are cognitively reinforced by the capitalist machinery of imagineering prosperous futures. These mutual dependencies restructure household relations so that they become the bearers of the capitalist final cause. Likewise, other areas of social reproduction beyond household and community, such as public welfare and social security services, are existentially dependent on national and state revenues, themselves generated through the socio-economic decommunization of, more than human, creative power. Public infrastructures and services, which are structurally dependent on and subservient to capitalist economic growth, consume massive amounts of natural resources and significantly contribute to climate change and the degradation of ecosystems. During financial crises, public investment, supercharged by creating massive financial and ecological debts, takes on the role of a savior. The policies that underpin these social reproductive services are directed toward protecting capital. In this way, state-funded social reproduction becomes a civilizing mechanism, adding to the stability of the system and reducing the need for highly destabilizing overt state violence and nakedly coercive power. In Fraser's terms, 2022, capital cannibalizes social, political, and ecological wealth in the zones behind or beyond the economy. But perhaps more critically, what underpins this cannibalization is that capital restructures these zones in its own image, emptying them of their commonest essence so that, together with alienated labor, they contribute to the making of fetish value. In other words, zones of social reproduction that exist outside of capitalist commodified relations and have commoning features are being annexed to the realm of capital. This can be referred to as capital's annexation of non-commodified zones of commoning in its socio-ecological frontiers, which is necessary for their constant decommunization, the hidden abode behind Fraser's hidden abode. Post-structuralist feminists take the root of substantial disengagement with capital by focusing on the realms of un or under colonized spaces such as community economy and unpaid domestic work hoping that the creation of capital-free autonomous niches of communal life would amount to a full systemic change see Gibson Graham, 1996, Gibson, et al., 2015.
The post-developmentalist pluriverse perspective follows the same logic. The nature society, ecology economy, and productive reproductive dualisms are not just intellectual and discursive structures. They are also strategies of power rooted in the structures of capital. Therefore, achieving nondualism requires more than a change in our perceptions and discourses and even more than building exemplary moments and isolated spaces of practicing nondualism. It requires strategizing against the power of capital. Any liberation of our imaginations from what we call, fetish value under capital may look like an improvement but will end up being a setback if achieved at the cost of profound disengagement with the political realities of capital and the struggles of the working class. As the post-class politics of politically disenchanted leftist movements grow, not only the productive forces but also unwaged reproductive laborers, traditional and precarious, in the global north, under Fordism or post-Fordism, and in the fast industrializing Global South, find no solid ideological base, no strong common system of values, no vernacular language that relates to their daily life experiences, and no unblemished ways of constructing functional alliances with middle-class postmodernists. Post-developmentalists, post-Marxists, and even revivalist Marxists who have, sub, consciously inherited a value-free notion of value from capital. Working classes, when deserted by the new left, now increasingly turn to their last resort among social democrats, who are rather marginalized in their own reformist political parties, and the nationalist populists who have been gaining the upper hand by radicalizing conservative parties or establishing their own parties, see Hosseini et al. 2022. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed not only the shortcomings of the system in safeguarding the lives of millions of people but also the continuing inadequacies of many counter-system movements in channeling the working class's distrust of the state, corporate sector, and the elite into a powerful, radically transformative political force resistant to the lure of radical populism, Gray and Gills, 2022. Despite these reservations, the post-structural and neo-anarchist ethics and value systems provide us with a highly insightful and rich set of ideas that can underpin the normative aspects of the communist approach to value theory. They can help us imagine, explore, and establish communist ways of living where the four indispensable sources of true value are fully functional. Such an image is not historically rootless. Quite the contrary. The social anthropological, archaeological, and historical accounts of past and present struggles to produce true value have disclosed and will continue to unveil the presence of the functionalities and transformative potentialities of indispensable commons. Literary, aesthetic, theological, and philosophical examinations of societal dreams and reflections on the metaphysical implications of the outcomes of evolutionary biology, quantum physics, and cosmology should be employed in our efforts in this direction. The results must also be coupled with critical analyses of how capital operates and evolves. While it is incorrect to define the harsh reality of capital solely as the absence or suppression of ideal alternatives, it is also problematic to exclude from our analysis of capital the truthful images that naturally arise from collective dreams, practices, values, norms, desires, needs, and struggles of historical counter-movements. The abstract concept of value provides a unique advantage in making this integration possible, as, value, is where the real and the ideal intersect. The negation of linear thinking about the historical development of social formations, the recognition of the principles of deep interconnectedness of the life domain, the acknowledgement that every individual being is a being in common or a becoming in common, and nondualism form the basis of pluriversalist thinking. This is a new paradigm that should be embraced in the communist value theory. However, when these principles are applied to the new paradigm itself, the result is more modesty and more integrity. Pluriversalism will find its own location in the broader communist paradigm. Only then will it supply the values that can underpin our normative vision of what constitutes true value as opposed to fetish value and feed our alternative imaginations and help us understand the existing potentialities within the uncolonized territories of life.
The incorporation of the normative notion of value, which emerges out of alternative imaginaries, into our analyses of capital will show us a more comprehensive image of capital than that which the orthodox Marxist tradition portrays. Capital is more complex than the product and process of the extraction of surplus value out of living direct labor. Rather, it is a fetish that functions as value, obscuring the true value of all the existing potentialities natural to humanity and the rest of nature for harmonious, inclusive, and sustainable self-fulfillment. Instead of defining capital by using the logic it imposes on life, we will be using the logic of life as a commons to reveal the true nature of capital. All four fundamental sources of true value as commons naturally regenerate and sustain themselves. Under capital, these ultimate sources are qualitatively deprived of their self-regenerativity and quantitatively short-changed. Their capacity for meeting the basic requirements of their reproduction is compromised as a result of the over-extraction of capitalist value. This is no longer limited to commodified labor. It is true that wage labor adds value, but value also needs other distinct types of causation to be fully realized. Value needs structure. It must have an objective, material embodiment or quality and has to play a function seen by society as a worthwhile end to pursue, by haunting the public's imagination. The ontological differences between these mechanisms of causing value should not be ignored. A flat ontological perception of capitalist value that is highly problematic. The Aristotelian theory of causation helps us avoid falling into the reductionist flat ontology by ontologically differentiating between the four essential types of causation. In our theory, labor and class do not lose their defining role. The Marxian notion of commodity value is based on the difference between the value required for the reproduction of labor in its decommonized forms and the total value extracted. However, the relationship between capital and the four fundamental sources of value is more complex than just the quantitative extraction and expropriation of commodity value. The difference between the value required for the regeneration of the fundamental sources of value after their perversion and the value extracted from their combination can be considered as surplus capitalist value, which in this case is a much wider and multidimensional notion than the Marxian one. The four ultimate causes of value are interdependent in the production of true value. Under capitalism, their commoning essence transmutes into properties of capital, and their harmony with one another is compromised. Their capacity to exist and function as commons, producing true value as their fuel or blood, is damaged. Regeneration turns into degeneration. The return of any portion of capitalist value through civilizing mechanisms such as wages, environmental rehabilitation programs, and welfare spending to increase their endurance is deployed only to slow down their degeneration and ultimately sustain capitalism for a longer period. Ecocentric revisions and revitalizations of Marxian value theory Apart from the first stage ecosocialists, identified by Foster 2022, who call for rejecting Marx's value theory based on its perceived ecological blind spots, there are two contrasting approaches to revising the theory. This dichotomy bears a resemblance to the divergent perspectives within the SRT camp discussed earlier. The first approach advocates the integration of nature into Marxian value theory. Ecosocialists such as Jason W. Moore, Ecosrafian value theorists, and the non-Marxian energy value school in ecological economics are among the groups that support this view, see Burkitt, 2006, pages 17. The second perspective, however, rejects the idea of ascribing capitalist value to natural resources. This includes Marxist revivalists like Foster and Burkitt, who see nature as one of the major objective conditions of the possibility for production but also non-Marxist ecological economists influenced by Herman Daly. Among the former group, some, by following Marx's differentiation between use value and exchange value, recognize nature only as a source of use value and wealth. See note 13. What constitutes value under capital is the exchange value or abstract labor. Ecological economists following Daly, on the other hand, do not consider any objective factor in production, including labor, as a source of value. 
They define value teleologically as the enjoyment of life, which is the ultimate benefit of every economic activity. The above-mentioned first approach of attributing value to nature is not without major limitations. When nature's value is defined through private exchange, capitalist value is ascribed, which leads to the disregard of nature's intrinsic value or the conflation of the two types of value. In a capitalist system, nature is ultimately commodified and subjected to market valuation, ultimately being fetishized as ecological, natural capital. The theory subsequently argues that, similar to labor, nature is exploited and depleted beyond its regenerative capacity. Nature is reduced to constant capital as reflected in Marx's famous equation of the rate of profit, and due to the inherent constant pursuit of profit, is overly cheapened and thus exploited. Moore, 2015. See Saito, 2017 b. For his criticism of Moore's ecological value theory. The result is additional surplus value. The theory, as Foster and Burkitt, 2018, argue, suffers from an ontologically monistic treatment of the work of labor and nature when expanding the notion of value. Moreover, the intrinsic value of the cheapened sources of value is defined according to their use value under capital, whereas the truly intrinsic value can and should be defined outside the realm of capital in the commoning state of living. The use value from a non-alienated livability point of view is essentially different from the use value achieved under capital. The latter gains ascendancy over the former facilitated by the surreal world of desires and the capitalist market valuation mechanisms. See note 14. The second approach keeps the conceptual scope of capitalist value limited to commodity value. At the level of theoretical abstraction, this method resembles what capital does to nature, that is, reifying or reducing nature to only a background condition necessary for commodity value production. The Marxian version of this approach exposes the mechanisms and consequences of this reduction, which, above all, are the metabolic rift between production and its natural conditions associated with the separation of labor from the natural means and resources of production and a type of alienation from nature due to the dissolution of the original unity between humans, as laboring individuals, and the earth. See Saito, 2017b, Saito, 2017. -a. Accordingly, the generalized market valuation, of nature, is rooted in the commodification of labor power based on the separation of the producers from necessary conditions of production, starting with the land, cited from Burkitt, 2006, page 11. Nowhere is the opposition between the two camps more starkly exemplified than in debates between Jason W. Moore and Foster Burkitt. See note 15. Moore criticizes Foster and Burkitt for failing to adequately draw on Marx's LTV or to reinterpret it as an ecological value theory. He argues for examining how capitalism has historically developed through nature, a metabolic shift, rather than simply evolving through creating a metabolic rift with nature. A rift, however, that seems rooted in a naive understanding of Marx one that is afflicted with an epistemological Cartesian dualism, society, versus nature. Moore's, 2015, pages 147–148, Ecological approach to reinterpreting Marxian value theory starts with Marx's arithmetic equation of the falling rate of profit. In short, since the organic composition of capital, the ratio of constant capital over variable capital, or C over V, outruns the rate of surplus value or the rate of exploitation, S over V, due to the constant employment of new technology to increase productivity, the rate of profit, which is S over, C plus V, will eventually fall. This tendency is, of course, met with counter-tendencies mobilized by capital to not only increase the rate of exploitation by intensifying labor but also by cheapening constant capital and variable capital. Capitalism thus relies on cheapening labor power, food, energy, and raw materials, i.e., Moore's four cheaps. Cheaper food, energy, and raw materials help to reduce the value of labor power by reducing the costs of producing means of subsistence, or in other words, reducing the socially necessary labor time needed for labor's reproduction, thus increasing the relative surplus value. 
Moore sees labor power as part of cheap nature, the world ecology of capital. Capital relies vitally on the underpaid work of all four cheaps. This way, Moore's approach has the advantage of preventing the dualism of society versus nature. His theory aims to show how nature is transformed, produced by capital rather than simply expropriated as a separate entity. Moore argues that the critical analysis of the capitalocene, a term he uses as an alternative to Anthropocene, must show the world historical process of how humans and nature are incessantly, co-produced, within the web of life, cited from Saito, 2017 b, page 281. Moore's concept of cheaps broadens the definition of value and surplus value by including the work of extra-human nature. According to Moore, capital exploits whatever can be capitalized paid work, energy, and appropriates, whatever cannot be immediately capitalized, the unpaid work, energy of the web of life. Ecological surplus, as he defines it, is the ratio of the former, mass of capital, to the latter, more, 2015, pages 101 to 102. See notes 16 and 17. Capitalist value is entirely reliant on the latter, which should be incorporated into the arithmetic of value theory by expanding fixed and variable capital. Despite their divergent perspectives, both approaches ultimately result in an unsatisfactory treatment of value. The resulting theories become mere replicas of the capitalist reality, which can be accepted only to the extent that the theory seeks to analyze and critique the system rather than directly transform it. Just as labor is the result of capitalism's primary abstraction of human creativity, the so-called nature is the product of the primary abstraction of the livability of the life domain. Moreover, the Aristotelian taxonomy of value causation can help us better understand the limitations of both opposing perspectives. Those who see the life domain as a direct source of value, like Jason W. Moore, pre-classical physiocrats, and today's Eco-Srophian energy value theorists, give primacy to the material cause of value. According to them, the work of labor as part of the life domain is still crucial as it draws on the riches of the rest of nature, unleashing their surplus-producing capabilities and transforming them into material means of subsistence for humanity. Here, however, value can ultimately be ascribed to objective substances of material condition and subsistence of organized life. Similarly, to consider, the surplus use of labor power as the primary essence of surplus commodity value is to give primacy to the efficient cause of value over the other three types of causation. To consider the enjoyment of life, or the satisfaction of human needs as the essence of value is to reduce value causation to only a final cause, the subjective and psychological benefits of activities. This theory, as articulated by Daly, Georgescu Rogan, and Banayuti, however, has the advantage of directly attributing normativity to the notion of value, by treating it teleologically as a final cause, but at the cost of sidelining other types of causation. How can we break through the impasse depicted by the limitations of the two alternative approaches to theorizing the value of so-called nature? As we previously proposed, the answer lies in recognizing four distinct types of value causation and including a normative definition of value in our analyses of capitalist fetish value. The normativity of the former type of value should be based on both the historically actualized and futuristically imagined commoning features of these four types of value causations. The scope of the analysis should be expanded beyond the inner dynamics of capital to where the decommonization of commoning sources of value occurs. This is where the bearers of true value are transmuted into the bearers of fetish value. The infra and meta processes and meta mechanisms that underpin these transitions should be the focus of the theory. Since these processes are destabilizing, by destroying the commoning foundations of organized social and ecological life, the civilizing mechanism must also be incorporated into the equation. Moreover, sources and makers of true value are not passive entities subject to capital's cannibalism. The commonizing mechanisms and processes should also be added to the picture, a picture that is more gray than black and white. 
Does this solution undermine the foundations of the Marxian value theory, or help reconstruct it without violating its underpinning meta-theory? Abstract labor as the substance of capitalist value does not reflect Marx's normative judgment about value nor even his judgment regarding the primacy of what constitutes value outside capitalist production relations. Indeed, Marx makes no presumption that the monetary exchange values of commodities accurately reflect wealth in all its natural and social diversity, either qualitatively or quantitatively, cited from Burkitt, 2006, page 28. A critical value theory, to be meaningfully transformative, must be able to show how value in its natural and socially diverse forms, or at least the use value of products when determined through unalienating relations, is lost or expropriated and also show how it can be restored. If no capitalist value can be assigned to so-called natural wealth, and if a meaningful transition beyond capital requires the re-communalization of production and its natural condition, we are then required to theorize the tensions and interactions between these two types of value, the capitalist, fetish value and the communist, true value. This can only be achieved when a more-than-human worldview is adopted in theory and practice that denies the dualism of nature versus humanity. The value of nature cannot be reduced to its use value when the normativity of use value is determined through alienating conditions of capital, or any subjugating system. A comparison of the works of Nancy Fraser and Jason W. Moore can be insightful here. Fraser, too, believes that we need a multi-standard critique of capital. She sees Marx as failing to adequately theorize the abode behind the abode of labor-centered exploitation, that is, the expropriation processes in the spheres of ecology, reproductive labor, and politics. However, Marx showed great interest in these spheres and saw them as entities reduced by capital to only sources of use value, rather than value, vital to valorization. These spheres are treated by capital as the essential conditions of possibility as far as they are left uncapitalized, uncommodified. To overcome the falling rate of profit, capital keeps expanding its access to these spheres, accumulation by dispossession, in Harvey's terms. Fraser goes beyond this to articulate Marx's perspective on the extra labor spheres as background conditions that make it possible for capital to function. See Fraser, 2022. She juxtaposes these spheres, but without theorizing how they are interrelated and how they are co-transmuted by becoming empty of their commoning essence while forming a new mechanical totality together. Saito, 2017b, page 284. The infra-process through which these spheres are turned into conditions of possibility and thus subject to cannibalistic appropriation is what is missing in most, if not all, major theories of capital. This explains why the normative dimension of value remains neglected. Reducing the extra labor spheres of value production to passive subjects of appropriation makes it unnecessary for Fraser to reconstruct Marxian value theory by redefining value. Moore, in contrast, recognizes the necessity of theorizing the mutual co-production of capital and the extra labor, and by extension extra human spheres of value production. Yet, this welcome move remains limited to only magnitudes and their ratios relations under his concept of ecological surplus. Like Fraser, Moore strives to extend the critical theory of capitalism beyond the inner structure of capital. They both build the division between the inner and the outer upon the distinction between exploitation and appropriation, capitalized and uncapitalized. Unlike Fraser, Moore's perspective reduces appropriation to cheapening, while he applies the term exploitation to encompass not only human labor but also any aspect that can be capitalized upon. Whether we emphasize the metabolic rift, as in the case of Foster, or the metabolic shift, Moore's argument, in explaining capital's deadly ecological contradictions, the level of analysis needs to go deeper than the actual, and extend into the real, infra-processes and mechanisms that underpin the co-devolution of all the spheres of value production into the mechanically entangled conditions of possibility for capital. Each one of these spheres in our multi-standard critique of capital plays the role of a different type of causality in causing value. 
We can then incorporate them into our account of value without violating Marx's emphasis on commodified labor power as the source of surplus value. Our theory maintains a central focus on production without descending into productivism. Notes on Chapter 6. 1. The implications of advancements in late capitalist production relations for the Marxian LTV have been debated among post Marxists and Marxist revisionists, and between the two camps. These advancements are identified under different titles. Some highlight new episodes in the history of capitalism that differ from the time when Marx developed his value theory, others emphasize new processes that challenge the validity of LTV deindustrialization, the precarization of labor, socialization of production, industry 4.0, etc. 2. These theories have been criticized for their Eurocentric focus, as they tend to represent the middle classes while excluding the lived experiences of workers in poorer communities. This criticism may not necessarily question their explanatory power in relevant contexts where late capitalism is expanding through new technologies. This trend includes many growing sectors in the Global South as well where the boundaries between social production and social reproduction have been collapsing due to factors such as the gig economy, deindustrialization, precariatization, and political and legal institutions that are unable to curtail the cruel and naked political power of capital. See Bananev, 2020. 3. There are authors who see Negri and Marx complementing each other. Tremczynski, 2022 uses the example of a machine harvesting body energy out of arresting person to mine cryptocurrency to illustrate how digital capitalism extracts value from social reproduction processes. Tremczynski argues that the decentralization of socialized production does not however make the Marxian value theory obsolete. Rather, the capitalist command of labor can be directly incorporated into the design of these structures and serve to extract value. 2022, page 20. Being politically decentralized, Bitcoin shows that control via economic appropriation and ownership can still be the prominent form of power under capital that capitalizes on socialized work. Bitcoin can thus serve as an exemplar of an emerging relation of production where the decentralized autonomous networks are designed to extract surplus value without necessarily resorting to the centralized political command. Quote from Tremczynski, 2022, page 32. 4. If wage labor is not the sole source of capitalist value, then it is necessary to broaden our understanding of how such value is extracted and manufactured in fetishistic forms through mechanisms that may differ from those found within the workplace. 5. The new interpretation makes the following claims regarding the labor theory of value. First, all value added derives from the expenditure of direct living labor. Second, values are measured in hours of abstract labor time and prices are measured in monetary units. Third, the value of the output is determined by the sum of the values of the non-labor inputs used up, labeled past or indirect labor, and the direct labor time spent. The non-labor inputs transfer their value to the output, while direct living labor creates new value added. Surplus value, the value corresponding to unpaid labor time, is the origin of aggregate profits. Hence, the rate of exploitation measures surplus value divided by the value of labor power or, equivalently, unpaid over paid labor time, quote from Rada and Purana, 2022, page 1050. 6. Value added, VA, as defined as the sum of variable capital and surplus value, V plus S. It is argued that only living labor, in total L, that adds value to the inputs of production. Therefore, VA is proportional to the total labor expended, L or the difference between C, and C. 7. Riggi believes that since Marx's theory of value differentiates between value and price, and since it is possible to have profit without producing value, Products produced without expending labor time do not add value even if they generate revenue. Therefore, LTV cannot be refuted on the basis that such products convey value without having labor time contained in them. Parkhurst, 2019. 
argues that Riggi fails to prove that deproduction, by its very nature, is non-value productive. However, he does not attempt to show that some, if not all, d is value productive. 8. Marx excludes the labor time expended in the original production of a commodity and instead emphasizes the most recent cycles of its re-production for the estimation of its socially necessary labor time or the abstract value contained. Therefore, following Marx, it is argued that as the share of labor time in the reproduction of immaterial commodities, such as digital information, approaches a negligible amount, LTV can no longer explain exploitation. However, critics of this argue that what is perceived as the so-called reproduction of immaterial commodities, such as the transfer of the digital replica of a software program to the computer of a buyer, should be regarded as an act of distribution rather than reproduction. See Parkhurst, 2019, page 81. Moreover, as Parkhurst reminds us, I, inarguably, capitalist firms that produce D sometimes receive more profit than corresponds to amount of surplus labor they preside over. But there is nothing novel or paradigm shifting about this. Super profits can be secured by any highly efficient or monopolistic firm, irrespective of whether its products are immaterial or instead fully corporeal and tangible. Quote from Parkhurst, 2019, page 84. 9. Capital has an inherent inclination toward maximizing profit, resulting in excess investment and overproduction, and thus paradoxically a decline in their profitability and, a system-wide evening out of the rate of return on investment. Quote from Parkhurst, 2019, page 73. 10. C. Keen, 2021, for a further discussion of the problem of externalities. 11. Attribution of terms like, techno-feudalism, as the end point to capitalism follows a technologically deterministic logic that can mislead liberation praxis by propagating a delusion that any coordinated action against oligarchic technocracies, like boycotting Amazon, can contribute to some sort of liberation. The emergence of these concepts in the literature, however, indicates a need for renewing the emphasis on the political or power coercive aspect of exploitation, as opposed to pure, economic means, of coercion or social control. 12. If the wage or basic income is supposed to be paid by the state out of its revenue, it will help capital by transferring the responsibility to the state, as another social institution alongside the household. This would be the transfer of the treatment of socio-economic costs of the social reproduction of labor, as a social externality, from the domestic sphere to the public sphere. 13. As Burkitt 2006, pages 16–17, discusses, Marx did not criticize physiocrats for attributing use-value to nature. Rather, he criticized them for conflating capitalist exchange value with its natural basis. 14. The greening of Marxist theory, which seeks to conflate the value of the work of nature with that of labor, is confronted with the challenge of translating the value of nature into prices, just as the classical LTV struggled with the transformation problem. 15. Nevertheless, both sides agree that Marx's ecological perspective exists. 16. Here, Moore appears to conflate the rate of exploitation with surplus by using the term, ratio, instead of, difference. 17. For Moore, capital is therefore more than an abstract movement of value. To prevent the fall of the ecological surplus, capital must actively draw on expanding the unpaid reproductive work of both human and extra-human natures. However, the four cheaps, or the seven cheaps in his later work, finally cease being cheap, and thus, the ecological surplus falls. <laughs>